Good morning, church. I'm Christina. I'm one of our pastors here, and I'm so excited I get to bring the Word of God this morning to you. We have been uh, really intentional with this series that we're in right now. It's our Advent series, and it's entitled Majesty. And church, as we designed it, we know that the holiday season can feel frantic and crazy and busy and exhausting. And we just wanted to have a series where as a community we could come and just rest in the presence of God and worship together and hear his word. And so we've spent the last couple weeks looking at this Christmas story through different angles and lighting our candles. The first week, Chris spoke on Simeon. You guys remember this? We had no power. It was dark and cold in here. And he brought the word of hope that Simeon was waiting for the Messiah, and he had hope that God would be faithful to his promise. And last week, Ryan brought the story to us through the eyes of Joseph. We lit the candle of faith, and he shared with us the story from Joseph's perspective and how he had faith and obedience after the angel spoke to him. This morning, we're going to talk about the story through the eyes of the shepherds. And now I have to tell you right up front, it is really cold in here. And it's not because we wanted you to feel like a shepherd in the field at night. I just have to let you know, that's not why it's chilly in here. Sorry, we're working on our heating situation. But I'm excited to have us look at the story through yet another angle. I love a good story. Anyone else love a good story? Yes, me too. I love it. And when I'm watching a movie or listening to a story um, or reading a good book, I love to find a character that I really identify with. Anyone else do this? Yeah, and as I've gotten older, the characters I identify with change. It's very traumatic when no longer do I see myself in the eyes of the young people. But in the Christmas story, I've always seen myself through Mary's eyes, right? In elementary school, I always thought it would be like the highest honor to get to be Mary in the pageant. And then when I became a teenager, I had like a new understanding of Mary's predicament, shall we call it. The fear and the panic and the shame and the embarrassment that she must have felt. And then when I was pregnant with my first baby, I understood a little bit more about what it was like for Mary to be expecting a child and on this journey to Bethlehem. And then after I had my first child, having gone through childbirth, I had a new understanding of her sacrifice, giving birth to a baby far from home and the comforts of that. But this morning, I want us to see the story through the eyes of the shepherds. I want to invite you to put yourself in the role of a shepherd for this morning. We're all going to be shepherds. Uh, But I want you to understand this. This might not be the shepherd that you're imagining. I don't know. Like when we start to read the Christmas story, some of us know it so well that like, I don't know, Charlie Brown Christmas pops in our head or we see different images. Let's just kind of do away with that this morning. The shepherds we're talking about are not like cute little eight-year-olds wrapped in their dad's bathrobes on stage, right? Like that's, that's not what we're talking about. And they're also not the shepherds that we see in those classical paintings, right, with like blonde, wispy hair and blue eyes, like spotless robes embracing like a a beautiful white sheep that never pooped or something. Like that's, that's not the reality of what we're talking about today. In Luke 2, actually, shepherds were unskilled laborers of the lower class. They were men who spent their days and their nights living in fields taking care of smelly animals. They had a reputation for being dishonest and dirty and uncivilized and unsocialized. Shepherds were actually often very uneducated, and they kind of had this reputation for being lazy. William Barclay, in his commentary on the book of Luke, he tells us this. This is going to pop up on the screen, but he said this. Shepherds were despised by the orthodox good people of the day. They were quite unable to keep the details of the ceremonial law. They could not observe all the meticulous hand washings and rules and regulations that their flocks made constant demands on them. And so the orthodox looked down on them. They were simple men living in the fields. And this is who I want you to imagine you are as I read to you this very familiar story in Luke 2. And in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the entire Roman world. And everyone went out to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David, 
This would have been about a 70-mile journey that he took, departed on. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. If you weren't with us last week, go back and listen to Ryan's sermon because he talks all about what it looked like in this Jewish tradition, engagement and pledging and all of that. It's very interesting. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby. Okay, this is us. This is us, the sheep. Come on in. Imagine these shepherds. There were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. All right, friends, let's just put ourselves in this situation for a second. We're shepherds. We're out in the fields. It's cold. It's nighttime. We're protecting our sheep protecting them from predators that want to come and munch on them, protecting our sheep who want to wander away. Sheep are not very smart. They need shepherds to, like, stay with them. This is our mundane life. This is what we do every night. And suddenly, an angel is in front of us. Y'all, I've never seen an angel. I don't know if any of you guys have seen an angel. I've never seen an angel. I would love to see an angel. My parents have a really cool story where they saw an angel. They were smuggling Bibles into China back in the 80s with my brother and my sister. They have the coolest story about how they're in this train station and there's no English anywhere and they didn't know what train to get on and they have these Bibles and such a cool story. I've never seen an angel before. I don't think these shepherds had ever seen an angel before. Suddenly in front of them there is an angel and we are told that the glory of the Lord shone around them so much so that they were terrified. I imagine that these shepherds were probably some burly, strong men. I could be wrong, but that's my impression of them, right? They're protecting their sheep. They're rugged guys. For them to be terrified, I can only imagine what this would have been like. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, right? First words, do not be afraid. Why would he say this? Because I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. This is the joyful news. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Don't be afraid. I've got a good message. Here's what the message is. The Messiah is here. These shepherds knew exactly what he was referring to. They had been waiting their lives for this Messiah. This was a joyful news for them. And this will be a sign unto you, the angel goes on to say. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Not lying in a bassinet, not lying in a crib, (laughs) lying in a manger. A manger was a feeding trough. I don't know if shepherds would have known much about babies, but they knew about mangers. They knew exactly where they were going to find that baby. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, a company of the heavenly host. This is also sometimes said as like an angel army filling the sky, accompanying this angel and praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Whew, that's amazing. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen them, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned. They went right back to their fields. (laughs) Having had this amazing experience, they had to go back to work. The rest shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Oh, Lord God, thank you for this word. God, thank you for this beautiful story. Thank you for this accurate account of your declaration of your son. God, I pray there will be no part of us today that hears this as mundane or something that we know well. God, may your word be living and active and change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. A king that deserved the grandest of entrances into the world, into a palace or a mansion with the greatest of doctors and physicians and midwives, 
with a grand and elaborate celebration. Instead, quietly was born into the night, into the dark, into maybe a cave or stable full of livestock, in a small town, to an obedient man and a humble and strong obedient woman. But his announcement, guys, it was fantastic. It was better than like any gender reveal or birth announcement you have ever seen. Starting with an angel and the glory of the Lord shining brightly. <sighs> so much so that it terrified the shepherds. Then a heavenly host of the angels declaring glory to God in the heavens and on earth peace on whom his favor rests. And to whom was this announcement given? The royalty of the day? Maybe like the really high priests in the temple or the high class citizens of reputation and influence and affluence? No. No, just to a group of shepherds who lived outside in fields with animals, who stunk like their animals, who had a reputation for being swindlers and dishonest and lazy, uneducated and social outcasts. Friends, a majestic baby king has been born. And instead of sending angels to proclaim this arrival to the noble and the elite, God chose a group of shepherds to be the first to hear this good news. This good news that would cause great joy for all the people. The news that God had sent his one and only son, a Messiah, a Savior, to save his people. And this beautiful and wonderful reality that God gave first to the shepherds can be a great source of joy for us. During the Christmas season, we see and hear the word joy everywhere, don't we? It's just, it's everywhere. It's in store windows and on our coffee mugs and some decorations and in Christmas songs. But I think if we kind of took a poll of how people were feeling around the Christmas season, I don't think a lot of people are feeling joyful. Christmas season, it, it can be hard. There's expectations, and there's hustle, and there's bustle, and there's family, and there's just a lot of pressure. And even for some of us sitting here today, it's a time of great pain. Maybe we're in a season of grief or depression or anxiety, and it just feels overwhelming. Today, I want to talk about joy, this joy of which the shepherds heard. Not the joy that's artificially written in big Christmas lights on someone's roof, or the joy that you get from having like a holly jolly feeling, or like that gingerbread feeling, whatever that means. Not that kind of joy, but a true joy from God. I love the way that C.S. Lewis talks about joy in his memoir, Surprised by Joy. Listen to this. This is how he says joy is. He says, joy must be sharply distinguished both from happiness and pleasure. Joy, in my sense, has indeed one characteristic and only one in common with them, the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. And I doubt whether anyone who has tasted it would ever, if they were given the power, exchange it for all the pleasure in the world. Joy is not pleasure. Joy is not happiness. It's not fleeting. I also love this definition of joy from Theopedia. It says, joy is a state of mind and an orientation of the heart. It is a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. I want to invite us this morning into a different kind of joy, a true joy, a life-changing joy, a tiny baby came to heal the world joy. The good news the shepherds received, was it was not just for them then. It is for us now. We still have a God that announces the good news to the lowly first. He still proclaims his joy to the shepherds of our world. We can find great joy in God choosing the shepherds, being the first to hear this good news through a few things. First, through his plan of being an unseen king. For some of us, it isn't hard to put ourselves in the shoes of the shepherds. As I described to you, them as being outcasts, socially unacceptable and unseen and unknown and undesirable and uninvited. Some of us feel like that's a definition or a description of us. That's who we relate to. And the beauty of God choosing shepherds is that we too are seen, no matter how unimportant we feel. God doesn't value those of wealth and prestige and religious honor or power over the unseen. When the angels declared glory to God in the highest 
and peace on, to men and women on whom his favor rests. The shepherds, they received this message first knowing that God's favor rested on them. They were favorable in the eyes of their God to be the first to receive this good news, even if they were not favorable in the eyes of the world around them. They were chosen for this message and chosen to be the ones to share it. I personally find great joy, great, great joy in knowing that our God is not removed, only caring about those that the world and our society claim is important. Somewhere deep in my mind, there is this very false belief that the Lord is most pleased with me when I'm winning, when I'm succeeding, accomplishing, using every talent to its most and best. Sometimes I confuse the world's approval with me and my own approval with me with God's approval of me. And somewhere in my heart, there's also this false belief that maybe God loves the lovable more than the unlovable, that he values the good, important people and not the unseen people that I oftentimes categorize myself with. But the good news is, God showing up first to the shepherds, it proves otherwise. Friends, if today as you sit here, you feel unseen, you feel unknown, if you feel unimportant and uninvited and unwanted and unworthy, the message of Christ to you today and to all of his creation today is this, I came for you. I died for you. I see you. I value you. And I love you. And this reality that our King Jesus does not sit high and removed, uninterested, or having forgotten us, brings great joy. Friends, we can find great joy in a king who values the unseen. Another beautiful way that we can find joy in this announcement to the shepherds is through his life, the life of Jesus as an unexpected king. God delivering his news to the shepherds first is a beautiful foreshadowing of the ministry that King Jesus would have during his 33 years on earth. What an unexpected way for a king to be announced. He wasn't your typical king. He didn't live a life of royalty and nobility and privilege and opulence. Quite the opposite. He would spend his days healing the contagious sick, casting out demons and teaching and instructing, welcoming little children to his side, and seeing women, truly seeing women and elevating their role in that society. Jesus shared meals, both with the social outcasts, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, as well as with important people dining at lavish tables. He lived a life of service and work, waking early in the morning to pray to his father, trying to hide from crowds who needed more and more and more from him. He was a king that grabbed precious naps on the floor of a smelly fishing boat in the middle of a storm. He didn't live a life of leisure. Matthew 20, 28 tells us, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so it makes perfect sense, perfect sense, that the Lord and King who came to lay down his life for the world wouldn't be announced to the noble or the elite or the religious or the superstars. Jesus was not the king that we expected, but he was the king that we needed. He was a shepherd king. In Hebrews 13, he's referred to as the good shepherd who lovingly cares for every single one in his flock, Guiding, feeding, protecting. This great shepherd was first announced to a group of shepherds. We can find great joy in a king who lived a life of service and sacrifice. A king for the unseen, lying in the manger. An unexpected king that ended up being the good shepherd. And the lamb of God who ended up laying down his own life. The final way this morning that I want to talk about that we can find great joy in this story, in this announcement to the shepherds from the angels, is in the death of Jesus as the Lamb of God. It isn't often at Christmas time that we talk about the death of Jesus. I'd rather just sit in the hope and the joy of his arrival, the freshness of a tiny baby, the miracles and the angel and the light and the star. But the truth is, this baby grew up and our greatest joy is found not in his coming, 
but in his death and in his resurrection. And just as an unexpected, just as unexpected that this baby king was wrapped in cloth in Luke 2 and laid in a borrowed manger. In Luke 23, his body was wrapped in cloth and laid in a borrowed tomb. There may be another reason why these shepherds were special, that there was something about them receiving the news that has significance, and it's this. See, Bethlehem is just a few miles from Jerusalem, not too far. And in Bethlehem is where the temple had their private flocks of sheep. See, every day in the temple in Jerusalem, they would sacrifice a perfect spotless lamb in the morning and at night. And theologians believe that these shepherds that the angel appeared to were actually the shepherds that looked over that private group of sheep that were then sacrificed in the temple. Friends, isn't that amazing? The thought that the shepherds who cared for the temple sacrifices were the very first to hear the good news of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the earth, as John the Baptist called out to Jesus in John. The death of Jesus was the final sacrifice. No more mourning and eating sacrifices would ever be needed. Our sin was paid for for once and for all through the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Our King, our Messiah, the Lamb of God. And friends, we can find great joy in a King who held back nothing, laying down his own life for our salvation. He was a King for the unseen, an unexpected shepherd King, and the Lamb of God. This morning, we're going to light a third candle. We're going to light the candle of joy. And as we go to light the candle of joy, I want to invite you to sit with a question, to ponder it a little bit, to sit in the presence of God and ask him to reveal to you the answer. The question is this, where do I find my joy? Going back to our definition of joy earlier, I love that definition of joy being a state of mind and an orientation of the heart, a state of contentment, confidence, and hope. Where do I find that confidence and hope and contentment? Do I find it in the things around me, outside of me? My job, my home, my bank account, my hobbies and my experiences in the community outside of me? Do I find it within me, my comfort and my contentment, my satisfaction, my achievements, my goals achieved, or my own inner peace? Timothy Keller, in his book, Hidden Christmas, talks a bit about St. Augustine, and I love this quote. I want to read it for you guys. He says, St. Augustine believed that even when you seem to be enjoying something else, God is the actual source of your joy. The thing you love is from him and is lovely because it bears his signature. All joy is really found in God. And anything you do enjoy is derivative because what you are really looking for is him, whether you know it or not. The joys that we feel in our lives are just a glimpse and a glimmer of the joy we can find in Jesus. The fullness of joy is found in the presence of a king of the unseen. The unexpected good shepherd, the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. That is where our contentment and our confidence and our hope are found. Amen? And as believers, our joy is found in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ only. Our joy is in our salvation, that we were lost, but we now are found. Without a savior, we're dead in our sin, living in pain and striving after things that will never satisfy our soul. Earlier, I asked us to imagine the story as the shepherds. I asked us to imagine that that's who we were. And yet my personal fear, friends, is that in this story, I wouldn't be one of the shepherds. I wouldn't be Mary. I wouldn't even be in this story. I would actually just be me, Christina, Not living out in the fields, but living in my warm home. Feeding my children dinner and doing the dishes and checking my email and sitting on my couch and enjoying my warm Christmas tree. Warm and contented 
and thinking that I'm joyful in my warmth and contentment, and yet unaware of the miracle that was happening right outside my door. My fear is that I wouldn't have been a part of the story at all, that I would have missed it, and that, friends, maybe I am missing it, that I'm in the wrong location looking for joy in the wrong place, missing the hope of the coming Messiah, the faith of Joseph, the obedience and sacrifice of Mary, the angels and the joy of the shepherd, and the promise being fulfilled of a baby who would grow to be the savior of the whole world. And friends, I don't want to miss it, and I don't want us to miss it. Today, as we light this candle of joy, we ask the Lord to forgive us for finding joy in things that are fleeting. And we ask God to reveal to us afresh this morning the joy in the birth of his son, the joy in a king for the unseen.